So without further ado, I'm going to give each of the speakers about five to eight minutes, and uh, I'm going to time them. So as soon as it feels like they're talking for too long, I'm going to just say like 30 seconds, etc., that kind of stuff, just to give them an idea. Um, and then I'll just move along with the mic, and then we're just going to open it up to questions. So I hope you have lots of questions, because uh, the goal of this event is to get them to answer as many questions as possible. So please, yeah, welcome, and uh, yeah, thank you. Let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, it's a big portfolio. It looks after every single municipality in South Africa. And then it looks after all the traditional leaders, uh, all the kings, all the chiefs, etc. the Nkosis, looks after all, all of that as well. Two separate departments within the, the overall Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs portfolio. It's a handful because Praveen Gordon, who is the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, says that a third of our municipalities don't function at all. He says that a third of our municipalities are okay, and then another third are functioning well. Just to put that in perspective, he includes this municipality in the functioning well category. So put that in your pipe and do what you need to do with it. I have a problem with his analysis. But also, he's put on the table a program called Back to Basics. Now, Back to Basics is not a bad program. It, what he's saying is that we need to do the basics right. We need to get our billing systems right. We need to have our finances right. We need to have proper people in government. Um, we need to get clean audits, etc. We need to fix the potholes. We need to collect the rubbish. We need to make sure the water that comes out the tap is drinkable, that the street lights work, uh, that houses are built. The things that you expect of, of local government. Unfortunately, this is the same thing that every minister before him has promised. And it, they just call it something different. So we're, we're entering into another five-year term of the national, well, we're now a year into the, 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 the new five-year term of parliament, the fifth parliament. And we haven't seen any major strides amongst municipalities. What we have seen is more municipalities being placed under administration or their municipal councils dissolved. And in every single case, every single case, it is because of ANC internal faction fighting. There is not one instance where it is due to other matters beyond the political side of it. It is factional fighting that has brought those municipalities down. Unfortunately, even with a minister like Praveen Gordon, who has enormous credibility, the department can't get things right. Let me give you an example. Makana municipality in the Eastern Cape, Grahamstown, used to be the gem in the ANC's crown. It was a Vuna award-winning municipality. That's the awards that the department gives out for top municipalities. It was the top performing municipality in the Eastern Cape was placed under administration last year or so we thought. Unfortunately, they didn't follow procedure. And uh, it now looks like everything they've done in the last six months is going to have to be thrown out, including the appointment of a uh, municipal manager, including the administrator that was brought in to run it for the last six months at enormous expense. 1.8 million rand they paid this administrator to run the, the municipality. And then you have to question, well, if, if this administrator was brought in irregularly, if she was appointed on an irregular basis, surely that means that every decision that she takes is null. The, the, the National Council of Provinces said that the, the intervention, the administration, was null and void. So that would imply that every single decision taken by the administrator in terms of that is then null and void. Every single decision over the last six months that has been implemented in that municipality is null and void. And this is on Praveen Gordon's watch. We've had municipalities dissolved. Now that's a new thing. Uh, the municipal council gets dissolved and a new bunch of councillors get elected. Except it's the same people that get re-elected. It's the same cronies and caters and cousins that, that were there before that get elected. Nothing changes. Just a kind of little bit of a turnover. We've also seen an increasing heavy handedness of the state. And here, yeah, you, you saw the, the police go into Parliament on two occasions, but I'm not going to talk about that. Marius can talk about that. I'm going to talk about two municipalities. 
The first one being Mohalakwena Municipality, just up the road here in Limpopo. Mohalakwena Municipality had two ANC factions fighting. The one got kicked out because of fraud and corruption, and uh, there were supposed to be by-elections. And the next thing, the police arrived and took over that municipality. It was essentially a coup d'etat. Now, there was no authorization for it. There was no warrant. There was nothing that required the police to be there, except for the fact that two ANC factions could not agree with each other. And it's been that way for the last six months. It's been that way since October last year. And it's still not resolved. The municipality is still not working. They've got a deputy director general of the department sitting there trying to sort out the, the mess. Okay, the police have backed off a little bit, but when Musi Maimani walked to go and he wanted to walk into the, the municipal offices, the next thing, the police arrived, Bob Dwyer, they, they prevented him from going in. That is indicative of the way that dissent is treated in South Africa. Now, when I say dissent, I'm not talking about protest. I'm not talking about people throwing petrol bombs or anything like that. I'm talking about someone who disagrees with you. And Marius will talk about that in a bit as well, I'm sure. The second municipality I want to talk about, and I'm sure some of you have read about it, is Malumulele, well, it's Tulamela municipality, uh, Toyandu in the far side of Limpopo. And there's a town there called Malumulele. Now, Malamulele is a rural town, but it's a bustling rural town. It's, it's got a vibrant economy. Its streets are busy. The taxis run backwards and forwards. Um, the people there were protesting because they were dissatisfied with the way that Tula Mela municipality, which is a huge municipality, half a million people were running this particular town. And they were saying that most of the money was being spent in one particular tribal area and another, their tribal area, was, was not receiving any attention. So they protested. I went to that town and it felt like I was in a war zone. In fact, it felt like, how many of you watched The Walking Dead? You know the zombie series where there's nothing? There's cars on the side of the road and there's big piles of rubbish and everything is barricaded up. That's what it felt like. There were police caspers at every intersection, caspers, which haven't been seen since 19, 1990. In this little town, there were 196 public order policemen that's right, policemen in full right gear with their R4s and R5s and shotguns and things like that. Every street corner. There was not another person walking around that town. This is in South Africa. That's martial law. The businesses, every single business, their doors were closed. They hadn't been working for three, three weeks at that time. And it, it lasted for about six weeks. It carried on like that for about six weeks. Now, this is indicative of the state of local government in South Africa. Where the ANC governs, there is, it is characterized by faction fighting, not just at small local municipality level, it is every single level. Nelson Mandela Bay, faction fighting. Buffalo City, faction fighting. Ekuruleni, faction fighting. City of Johannesburg, faction fighting. City of Chwane, faction fighting. And this is the problem with ANC government. Where we govern, we govern well. Of the 30 municipalities in the, in the Western Cape, 26 are governed by the DA, and 28 municipalities in the Western Cape got clean or, or, got clean or unqualified audits. We govern better. And we're not perfect, but we do a better job. So, my name is Natasha Mazzone. Some of you knew me as Michael, um, but I've gone back to my family name. Uh, I have the great joy of being responsible for companies like ESCOM and SAA and Danelle and Alex Kaur and the list gets so depressing I sort of stop it there at a certain point and it always makes me laugh when Julius Malema says let's nationalize the mines because I look after the only nationalized mine in the country and it's also the only diamond mine in the world that doesn't run at a profit but Julius Malema doesn't want to see that but I think most importantly and, and on the tip of everyone's tongues at the moment is the crisis at ESCOM and I get uh, asked to speak about the crisis at ESCOM uh, basically on a daily basis. And that's what I'm going to focus on tonight because I think it's probably the most important thing because it affects all of us um, very, very profoundly in our daily lives. The fact of the matter is this, we do have a national crisis on our hands, whether the government is willing to admit it or not. We have a power grid system that was put in place to provide power for pro approximately six and a half million South Africans because it wasn't designed to take all South Africans into account. 
Of that there is no denying. But we cannot blame Jan van Riebeck on the national power grid crisis. What happened was at a certain time when the ANC came into power, they should have started to build power stations and they should have started to look at renewable energy and alternative sources of energy because we knew that more people had to be powered, we knew that we were a growing economy, we knew that our industry was growing and this wasn't done. Why wasn't this done? It wasn't done because the right people weren't around to get the right tenders and let's just call it what it is. We look at the two most important power stations being built in our country at the moment, it's Madupi and Kusile. The Madupi power station has got from the World Bank the largest loan ever received in the history of mankind. And the interesting thing about this loan is this. 40 years after Madupi is out of commission, we would have just paid back the capital of that loan. So not only did it overrun its budget by billions and billions of dollars. Now you know what the Rand exchange rate is. I'm saying dollars. But we are also eight and a half years behind on schedule. And we also don't comply with the Kyoto Protocol in terms of how we're going to clean the air. That literally people are going to be poisoned to death in the area surrounding the Madupi project. We have one silo, one boiler that's up and running. And it's not producing electricity, contrary to what the minister will tell you. It is being tested to see whether or not the, the boiler will hold when it is heated and cooled down, because that's how badly it has been built. So for six months, they're going to heat it up and cool it down and heat it up and cool it down. And only if it doesn't break, will it start to produce electricity probably around September. And that's just one unit. There's six units that still have to come online. Kusile is so far behind that they won't even give us an estimate as to when we can expect Kusile to add to the grid. Now this is the interesting thing. We live in a country where we have 360 days of sunshine somewhere in the country at any one given time. But we don't have solar panels going up on every single building, on every new build project, on our houses, because there's no incentive for people. There's no incentive for builders and, and, and companies, construction companies, to make windows with solar panels inside that would power their entire building. And Kevin and I and, and Musi Maimani were recently in Taiwan, where we witnessed entire skyscrapers, where the one side of the skyscraper was glass, and the entire glass panel was a solar panel. Now, if they're doing it in countries like Taiwan, where it's monsoon season for 11 months of the year, why aren't we doing it in South Africa? This is questions that we need to ask. And it's quite simple. ESCOM has a monopoly. The government wants ESCOM to keep that monopoly, and they don't want that monopoly broken, because that's what the ANC government do. Even with the building of Madupi, I asked to see the contracts. It's quite well known that I did a PI application. I can't see those contracts, and I can't see those contracts for one reason. One of the biggest suppliers for the Madupi contract was Hitachi Power South Africa. Hitachi Power South Africa has an investment wing called Chancellor House. The ANC have an investment wing called Chancellor House. Chancellor House, without a doubt, aided the ANC in paying for an election. And that is why those contracts will not be produced. They're willing to admit that Chancellor House was involved, but they will not let us see the contracts. So now we have to go to court. And that's why many of you in this room that are sitting here tonight are people that I come to see regularly and I ask you for money. Because if I don't come and ask you for money, I can't go to court to get these contracts and to expose this kind of corruption. But this is what's happening, and this is why our power supply is in the state that it's in. There's a bill in Parliament, well it's actually not in Parliament anymore, that's the problem, it's called the ISMO bill. And this bill would allow independent power producers to add on to the grid. It wouldn't create a new grid because our grid is actually good and our grid is actually stable. The problem is we don't have enough electricity to put onto the grid. So this bill would allow anyone to put up a wind turbine in your garden. And if you powered your house and you had excess electricity, you could sell it to ESCOM and ESCOM could add that electricity to your grid. Not only would this solve the power crisis, it would create jobs. And that is what we're about, or at least what we should be about. We should be about creating jobs. If you don't have a secure energy supply, you cannot grow industry. 
If industry doesn't grow, you cannot create jobs. So no matter what, uh, I almost said Madiba. <laughs> that was terrible. No matter what Jacob Zuma tells you at Sona, that he's going to create so many, so many millions of jobs, he's not. Because foreign investment is shrinking, industry is shrinking, big business is shrinking, small business is shrinking. Because every time we have load shedding, think of this. Those of you that have big business, you know how it affects your business. But you have enough money at the end of the month to cover any losses that you may have made. If you own a spaza shop in Mamelodi and your power goes off for eight hours, which is what happens during stage three load shedding, which is what we've been experiencing now, your fridge completely defrosts and all the chicken and meat in your fridge spoils. You are not big enough to carry that cost at the end of the month. So you cannot buy new stock and you land up closing your door. So what does that mean? It means entrepreneurs, people trying to take control of their own future, are losing business and are losing their own jobs that they themselves have created because there's no energy supply. I just quickly want to touch on SAA. Privatize, privatize, privatize. If a company isn't working, sell it to a company that can take over Put people in charge who know what they're doing with the aviation industry, who are not ANC cronies and aren't owed favours by the ANC government, and can actually turn a profit on an airline. It happens all over the world. Most European countries, their airlines are privatised. They still have the country's name on it, which would be exactly the same situation with South African Airways. The difference is you and I would not be paying with taxpayers' money to have good money being thrown off to bed. So the three things I would like to run through is, first of all, uh, the night of the State of the Nation address. Um, that's something that I missed half of it of uh, because, as I'm sure some of you have heard, I was arrested at four o'clock in the afternoon. I'd always thought that if I were going to be arrested in my life, it would be for drunken disorderly conduct or <laughs> public displays of nudity or those kind of things. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, it was for something I, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately for me, it was something I, I really believed in. Standing up for what I believe is the basic rights that all of us have in the new South Africa. I was fortunate also to spend most of my life thus far on the other side of 1994. And therefore the values that we hold dear are deeply ingrained in me. And so on the date of the State of the Nation address, what happened was I was sitting in my parliamentary office waiting for us to parade down the street to go into Parliament and go and listen to a, I don't even know how many hours it was, like I said I wasn't there. Far too many. Far too many hour long speech of the President. Um, I was informed that they are arresting and forcefully removing peaceful DA supporters from Adley Street, two blocks from Parliament. And I was requested as, as both a Member of Parliament but also as a National Spokesperson to go and ask why they are removing our supporters. This is not 1984. I proceeded down Adderley Street, made my way around, and I arrived at the back end of this police contingent and proceeded to inquire. I said, and I identified with my badge, I'm a member of parliament, I'm a DA national spokesperson. Why are you removing these people and who is in charge? And they referred me to the man over there who I subsequently learned is Colonel Lucas, who's quite notorious. He's the one that led the proceeding into the house to remove the EFF at the last, uh, on the last occasion horrible man. I went to him and I said the same thing, who's in charge, etc., badge, all that, and he ignored me, which is, I'm used to that, you know, I deal with the ANC on a daily basis. The water cannon came around the corner and a police contingent came around the corner and they started bashing me with their shields out of the way, bashing me out with their shields out of the way. I kept on shouting and some of you may have seen the photos of me shouting. Um, they, <laughs> those photos were taken at the wrong time because I don't shout like that normally. Um, but I shout like this and for some reason this happened. And my hand gestures looked like I was a metal concert in Adelaide Street. Um, I was pushed to the ground by my arresting officer who's a very nice guy, a family man from Pau. Um, pushed me to the ground again and picked me up on the back of my jacket and said, now I'm arresting you for standing in front of a police officer. which. I continued to protest and there are other photos that I said, that's not a charge. What charge is that? I know the law, etc. Because I'm also on the Justice Committee and, and, and law is something I'm quite passionate about. Um, I was put in the back of a police van that drove around for two hours trying to uh, 
I suppose, pacify the situation. They fortunately did not take us to Cape Town Police Station because they knew, A, the media was waiting there and they had now arrested a member of parliament but also a national spokesperson and also uh, the, the leader of the DA in Cape Town um, that they had arrested and three other staff members. So they took us to Woodstock Police Station, which is a very lovely old building but a terrible police station, better than the Cape Town one, where we sta stood in the courtyard for about an hour, uh, the people who were arrested were still smoking and oh, I, d I don't smoke anymore. Um, I was on my phone, I was phoning um, and I want to, uh, for the first time on a public platform refer to him as such, I was still on the phone with my husband because um, we got married in November and, um, okay, don't take any of my time. <laughs> and so we were there until two o'clock in the morning and to make a long story short, we eventually got bail for over a thousand rand each. Now, the, the, my attorney said to us at the time, rapists have got off for less than that, on bail. And we were detained for eight hours with, with them trying to figure out what to charge us with. After five hours, they decided, okay, public violence. And as a friend of mine says, he, know I'm many, he knows I'm many things, but I'm definitely not violent, um, <laughs> not even after wine. Uh, and we were released and I appeared in court the next morning and uh, we were told to come back three weeks late, six weeks later, and eventually the charges were dropped. But the State of the Nation address and everything that has happened in Parliament since has placed our country at an incredibly important crossroads, an incredibly important position. We as a party have maintained for quite some time now, uh, since Helen was elected in 2007, that we need to build a viable alternative to the ANC at the centre of South African politics. The EFF is not in that, uh, in that configuration at all, and neither is a very big part of the ANC. And these events have uh, clearly demonstrated that the EFF ANC battle is a, it's an internal a family feud. They're angry with one another because the one had stabbed the other one in the back and the other one's going to arrest the other one for tax evasion. So it's an internal family feud. And throughout all of this, it is clearly and adequately demonstrated that the only party that can steer the center of South Africa, hold the center, make sure we're on a stable road to prosperity and eventually 8% growth is the DA. And it's important uh, because going into the future, this is the second thing I want to address, um, going into the future, every single one of you sitting in this room and every single one of your friends that you're in touch with, and especially in a municipality like this, are absolutely pivotal and critical to ensuring that we win Chwane in 2016. And it is a very big reality. In 2014, on the provincial ballot, the ANC got 49%. They lost Chwane. If it was a local government election, they will not be in control here. They would have to stitch together a coalition of such disparate political parties, which would collapse. If every single person sitting here reaches one or two people who don't vote, and I know there are many, especially in Pretoria East, so I'm talking to all of you, to go out and encourage people to vote, because we are at a crossroads in, in, in this country. And we can only for so long run to the courts to ensure that the centre holds. And as Natasha said, we need money for that. Court cases are 10 million rand thus far on a court case that I'm going back to on Monday, um, just to give you an idea of the week ahead. On Monday, the DA is back in, in the court for the NPA versus, Demo uh, versus uh, D the DA to make sure uh, Jacob Zuma is prosecuted eventually. And also in the Western Cape High Court to make sure that the police never enter parliament again. That's not their domain at all. And on Tuesday, we're deba debating a motion of no confidence against the president. We know the ANC will rally around the president, but it's important for us to put on a pl public platform how this man has not only put South Africa on a, a terrible path, but also how he's managed to, in many ways, destroy the, and hollow out the institutions that we hold so dear, from the public protector to the hawks, all of those institutions. But because in the ANC there's that culture that if the leader is under attack, you rally around him. The FF um, has managed to galvanize the caucus, and we see that now. I mean, there were definite grumbles after the election, even before the election. And, and my friend said to me, the caucus are very unhappy, and that the ANC parliamentary caucus now, and it plays out across the rest of the country. But also that um, even in their caucus, they are what we refer to as Castle Corner or the Shabin at the back, which are just anathematic to what the ANC that I know, uh, having not grown up in it, but you know, that I know that, that they're not about that. So the ANC is in a, is, a, is in a terrible shape. It's in a very terrible shape. I can say I, I sit on the Rules Committee of, of Parliament because uh, I'm also the legislation whip. 
Um, so I see the split uh, every time we have a rules committee meeting. And the split goes like this. Um, there are those that are in favour of a very democratic, very uh, freedom charter kind of ANC. And the, then there are those that are in favour of the Jacob Zuma, whatever I say goes ANC. Um, in our rules committee, which is quite strange for me, is the, the real ANC comes out and will tell the other ANC quite openly in front of media to shut up and with in, in those particular terms. Um, what we discuss in the Rules Committee at the moment, and it's all, it consumes our time, is when do police ever come into Parliament? And what I term the real ANC say, police never set foot on the sacrosanct ground of Parliament unless your life is in danger. So unless, unless I pull out a gun or a knife and I'm trying to physically attack a fellow member, I may never be removed by police that are armed. And we've actually gone so far as to put this in the rules, we've put it in a guideline, we've got an operational manual, and then what happens? The EFF stands up, says something, and armed police came in, they walked past all of us, we saw them. I mean, we've got photos, they had two glocks each side. I mean, these were seriously armed policemen. There was an ANC faction that were willing to cross the floor and fight for us, if need be, and there was a faction that were willing to stand behind the police and watch us get shot, if need be. So there is a massive split going on and even in my own portfolio one can see the split happening in the ANC if one looks at Lynn Brown and Tina Jomat peterson Tina Jomat peterson is in charge of energy. When the Russian nuclear deal was signed or not signed or maybe signed because nobody knows for sure, the one person who didn't know anything about it was Lynn Brown because they're on two different camps. So the two camps were talking. So the Minister of Energy just conveniently forgot to tell the Minister of, of ESCOM that there might be a nuclear deal happening. So that's the kind of split that you see happening in the ANC at the moment. First of all, the split is, is along the lines of the radicals, the, the people that believe more in the Freedom Charter side and the National Democratic Revolution side of the party, and those who believe in the Constitution, the rule of law, the National um, Development Plan side of the party. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail on this, but that's where you see the split happening. And it's not a, it's not a clear-cut split, it's crumbling at the edges. Um, we heard today quite an interesting story about, about the Portfolio Committee on Communications, which looks after the SABC, and how that particular Portfolio Committee is actually quite an or is dominated more by the anti-Zuma uh, faction and how that played out in the Ellen Chabalala um, sort of story. So we are seeing these things happen and we are seeing small victories be made. It's going to be very interesting to see who falls where. The, the one thing that I do want to touch on though is that you do have a very large unelected political party in side the ANC and that's the South African Communist Party and when I say large I'm not talking large in terms of uh, votes that they receive because they've never been they've never stood for an election I'm talking about the the control that they wield if you have a look at the the ministers and the deputy ministers a lot of them come from an SACP background now the interesting thing is the SACP used to be the intellectual side of, of the ANC and I don't think it's still the case. I think what you've what they've become is a bunch of rebel rousers a la EFF and they're pushing a Marxist Leninist philosophy uh, trying to out EFF the EFF with inside the, uh, within the ANC. So this is the issue that we've, we've, we face. The other interesting split that that we haven't really touched on is the Kasatu split and Kasatu is more and more being marginalized by the ANC within the alliance, but even within Kasatu, their biggest union uh, has now pulled out and is now no longer part of the union. So that's going to have an effect down the line. And that's something that, that we will be very interested to see what happens in 20, 2016. What's interesting in the Rules Committee is we fight for the motion of no confidence to be a secret ballot. Now, why we do this is because when you elect the president and when you elect the Speaker of Parliament, it's done by secret ballot. So certainly when you have a motion of no confidence in them, it should be done by secret ballot too.
but it's not done by secret ballot because then of course you register your vote. I don't know if you've ever seen where we sit in Parliament, there's screens in front of us. So that screen has your name and then it has a yes, no and abstain button. So everyone that, that votes in favour, you press yes and it logs what you voted. Yes. So of course, exactly. So of course the ANC would know if anyone had voted against the President. And in the Rules Committee, one of the biggest fights that we have is that a certain grouping of the ANC want a motion against the President and the Speaker to be a secret ballot and a certain section want it to be a, a, a normal vote in Parliament. So I think that's very telling as well. Again, I, I refer back to the Rules Committee because this is the committee that's the most interesting for me at the moment uh, in terms of what we're trying to do in restructuring Parliament. So the EFF, you send whips to the Rules Committee because it's ideally the whips that create the, the rules. That's what you're supposed to do. So in six months, four different whips from the EFF have represented the EFF on the Rules Committee. Their intelligentsia as I like to call him, was a woman called uh, uh, Lichfield Chabalala, Chabalala, who was unbelievable. This woman, A, had a photographic memory, so she would read the sections of the Constitution and then close the book, and then she could verbatim tell you what she just read. She literally does have a photographic memory. She was stable, she was um, rational, she wanted Parliament to work. She wasn't one of the radical, let's burn Parliament down to get TV coverage. When they realised that was happening, she was pulled. Gardy, who's uh, much more, he's a revolutionary, came in, he wanted no rules whatsoever, anarchy, I speak when I want to speak kind of attitude. He was then pulled. Someone else who I'd never met in my life came in, who subsequently disappeared, never seen them in Parliament again. And now Floyd Shabangu, who is their chief whip, sits there and doesn't say a word and quite frankly now never comes to the Rules Committee anymore because he just says to me, ah, whatever you say is okay. So of course it suits me just fine because he's not there to argue with me and the less people there to argue with me, the more my argument and the more I can talk, which we all know I like to do. So I've got no problem with that. But it shows that within their own ranks, they actually don't know who's in charge. At some point, the, the theatrical politics comes to an end because you, you could see once, once they'd done the payback, the money, payback, the money, payback, the money 10 times, there was no substance left. When it came to asking the, 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 the president actual real questions, Besides pay back the money, they had nothing left. So once he'd answered the question of pay back the money, it was like, okay, well, let's all go home. And they all left. So four of them sat in their benches while the rest of us made sure that the, the president was held to account. And they all left. They flew home. They flew back to their provinces. They were nowhere to be seen. So this is a problem because these people in, in the EFF actually hold immense influence over young unemployed youth because their message appeals. It's a revolutionary message. It's a message that you've been given nothing, we will give you everything. And of course, if you're uneducated and poor and you have nothing, that is the kind of message you want to hear. But at some point, the theatrics is going to stop and people are going to realize that there's no substance. And it's going to take a while, but very soon you're going to see that they're just going to disappear from, from being in parliament and become completely irrelevant. The EFF are essentially at this point a one-issue party. They haven't got a position on anything else really. They, they want land expropriation without compensation, but they've never put anything on the table. They've never, all they've said is, we'll give you our votes to the ANC. Nothing further than that. So that's the first thing. The second is that they play games. They, they, they jump up and down in the house raising points of order. Oh, that one's chewing gum. Oh, that one waved her hand at me. Oh, this, oh, that. And it's, it's theatrics. It's it's, it, it disrupts the flow of, of business. It means that we don't get through the work that we need to get through. Um, and frankly, it irritates... I was going to say something, but it irritates me immensely. It irritates me immensely. So that's the second thing. Um, the third thing that and maybe this goes back to, to the ANC, is that the EFF are essentially the children of the ANC. And they've learned their bad habits from the ANC. So EFF had a provincial congress, when was it? In, in November or December, in, where, in Limpopo, where pangas were brought out and people were attacked in their provincial congress. Now you wouldn't see, you wouldn't dream of seeing that. I'm, I'm very relieved that no one's broken any bottles or brought a pango or crashed a chair or anything <laughs> like that tonight. 
But you wouldn't see that at a DA function. That's not how the DA operates. But you would see it at an EFF thing, and you're starting to see it more and more at ANC congresses and uh, party functions and things like that, because it's a culture that started within the ANC. That said, we have to watch ourselves as a political party. As we, we grow and, and attract new members, and we start attracting people from other political backgrounds, and, and particularly people who come from a, a more radical background, we need to watch that we don't bring these tendencies in. So we need to make sure that there's discipline within our ranks, and as a political party that, we in, that our members are upstanding, that we hold them to account, and that they do what is expected of them, that they represent us, and they put forward the best face of the DA.